If you thought that Luffy's 3D2Y message was sneaky, well then get ready to have your mind blown because there is another hidden message within this hidden message, which becomes apparent when we closely examine the Y portion. And there we go, a very sneaky little subscribe button, subconsciously telling you to subscribe to the Grand Line Review for regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and more specifically, welcome to Sagas in Minutes, the very occasionally produced series that aims to equip you with the basic knowledge to leap into the wilderness of One Piece. And today, we are finally, finally, going to be concluding the massive piece of story that was the Paramount War Saga. So I've stated this a couple of times already, but the Paramount War Saga is the sixth in the series, consisting of 108 manga chapters and 122 anime episodes. And in previous editions, we have explored the Straw Hat separation, Luffy's adventures in Impel Down, and spent an entire episode covering the events of the Paramount War itself. And today, we find ourselves covering the post-war events of this saga. And we pick up in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Marineford. The strongest man in the world, Edward Newgate, has fallen, and the Marines have emerged victorious. And this is an event that would reshape the world as we know it, with pirates everywhere immediately springing into action to claim Whitebeard's former territories in an effort to fill the power vacuum left by the death of one of the four emperors of the sea. One such example of this would be Brownbeard, who attacked the town of Food Valton and claimed that he now ruled the island. Well, we'll see how long that lasts, eh, Brownbeard? But repercussions of the war aren't simply condensed to those affected by Whitebeard, as the world government has also begun to readjust the warlord system, and the powers that be judged that Gekko Moria was now too weak to be amongst their ranks, assigning fellow warlord Dolphamy to assassinate him, although this attempt was ultimately unsuccessful. To start filling the vacancies left by Moria and Blackbeard though, the world government invite a most unlikely candidate into their ranks, being Buggy the Clown, who made a name for himself during the battle, mainly through shooting propaganda videos. But nonetheless, Buggy had developed an impressive following and would come to accept this offer and become a warlord of the sea. Meanwhile, in a more somber state, Luffy was taken to Amazon Lily and having regained consciousness, he is now lamenting Ace's death, which becomes our gateway into a most unanticipated Luffy flashback where we find our ourselves on Dawn Island 10 years prior to the modern day. This story tells of how Luffy's grandfather Garp took him to be raised by mountain bandits after being, in Garp's own words, influenced to become a pirate by Redhead Shanks. So at this point, Luffy has his straw hat, as well as his dream to become the Pirate King. The bandit group he was dropped off with was led by Curly Dadan, a name that has come up before in the series, being mentioned by Whoopslap. Remember Whoopslap? But also present within the bandit's territory is a young Port Gasty ace, whom Garp had also taken in and then promptly dropped off with bandits after a request from his rival Goldie Roger, the father of Mr. Ace. Now Luffy being the charming boy he is, immediately attempted to make friends with Ace, despite the fact that Ace had spat on him and very, very clearly wanted nothing to do with him. But as we all know, Luffy is persistent and eventually after a montage, he stumbles upon Ace and another boy by the name of Sabo in a series of events whereby Luffy was captured by a member of a group known as the Blue Jam Pirates, specifically by the member Porchemi. And now in what is probably one of the darkest moments in One Piece history, Porchemi proceeds to torture a very, very young Luffy until he is eventually saved by Ace and Sabo, which acts as something of a bonding experience and the three boys soon become friends. And shortly after that, they even take things to the next level by becoming brothers through the ritual drinking of sake. Now, something important to note about Sabo is that he comes from a very different background to Luffy and Ace. And in fact, Sabo is the son of nobility of the Goa Kingdom, the ruling faction of Dawn Island, specifically a man named Outlook III, who hired the Blue Jam Pirates to find and return Sabo, which they successfully did. And after being re-indoctrinated into his life of aristocracy, Sabo soon discovers a plan to cleanse the Goa Kingdom by setting fire to the entirety of the Grey Terminal an area of the island where the poorest of the poor reside. And this was being done because a world noble was on their way to inspect the Goa Kingdom. And so Sabo ran away once more in an attempt to warn everyone, but it was too late as the fire had already been ignited, also trapping Luffy, Ace, and the Blue Jam Pirates amongst it. Now the majority of the citizens, including Sabo actually, would go on to be saved by a certain Monkey D Dragon, who invoked a particular power to provide the Great Terminal residents with a path to safety, and even offering those who desired it a place amongst his revolutionary army. In the meantime, amongst the blaze, Ace and Dadan became locked in combat with Captain Blue Jam, while Luffy was taken to safety by the rest of the mountain bandits. But together, Ace and Dadan would have a hard fought battle, but they would eventually overcome Blue Jam, with Dadan becoming greatly injured in the process and being carried back to the bandit residence by Ace. Although by this time, Sabo had made the decision to set sail and fulfill his dream of becoming a pirate. Unfortunately though, he picked quite probably the worst possible time and day to do so, as his quote unquote ship aesthetically offended the visiting world noble, who immediately took out a massive bazooka style gun and fired it directly on Sabo, leading us to believe that Sabo perished that day. Spoiler alert, he didn't, and we never believed that. 
Ace and Luffy did though, and that's what's important. In fact, they both took Sabo's death particularly hard, although Ace eventually summoned up the resolve to say to Luffy that they had to live their lives with no regrets. That one of these days, they were going to live lives freer than anybody. They were bound to make enemies and their lives would be in constant danger, but they would be free. Ace then decided that he and Luffy would each set sail when they reached the age of 17, a time which came swiftly for Ace and then also for Luffy, which took us back into the modern day with Luffy still gutted over the death of Ace and disgusted by the fact that he was too weak to have saved him. But instead of Ace being here to comfort Luffy, this time that role would fall to Jinbei, who proceeded to lovingly strangle Luffy and force him to remember that he still had his crew. All of the Straw Hats were out there, ready and waiting to resume their adventure with Luffy. But a reunion would not be quite that simple. This is because by this time, Rayleigh had literally swam to Amazon Lily, because that's just what a living legend can do, casually swim through the calm belt like that. But upon arriving on the island, he offered to train Luffy in the art of Haki, a power system that had made vague appearances before now, but that we had never really delved into. But this offer would be the catalyst of Luffy deciding that the Straw Hat Pirates would take a two year hiatus. And in order to pass this message on to the rest of the crew, Luffy, Jinbei, and Rayleigh caused a big scene by sailing to the remains of Marineford in the guise of paying their respects to the departed Ace. However, rather sneakily, Luffy was also sporting a tattoo on his arm, sure to be photographed, and published in newspapers all around the world, which read as 3D2Y, with the 3D crossed out, implying that instead of meeting up in three days, they were instead going to reunite on Sabadee in two years. And all of the Straw Hats immediately understood this message, as well as the fact that they themselves needed to get stronger so that they could not only achieve their own dreams, but also allow Luffy to reach his dream of becoming the Pirate King. And this led to an unwavering display of loyalty amongst the crew, especially from Zoro, who had been sent to Kuragana Island, the home of Drakeul Mihawk, the world's greatest swordsman. This was the man that Zoro had his sights set on defeating. However, for the sake of Luffy, Zoro got on his hands and knees and begged Mihawk to train him. And all of the Straw Hats would find themselves in similarly convenient situations, thanks to the efforts of Bartholomew Kuma. In regards to Nami, she was now present on a tiny sky island known as Weatheria, where she would be able to study and innovate with the world's leading weather scientist. Usopp was blonked on the boy in Archipelago, where he would meet Heracles and be taught about all sorts of incredibly dangerous yet powerful plants that could be harnessed for a variety of purposes, very very much including combat. Sanji, to his eternal dismay, was sent to the Kanbaka Kingdom, the land of Okama ruled by Emporio Ivankov, who you may remember was an ally of Luffy during the Impel Down and Marine for Darks. And after a rough start to say the least, Sanji took up the challenge of defeating the 99 masters of New Kama Kempo, with each of them holding a special recipe for a dish designed to drastically improve a certain aspect of anybody who consumes it. Chopper would end up within the Torino Kingdom in South Blue, which while it initially seemed like a fairly backwards tribal area of the world, was actually home to an extensive library of various rare and unique medical texts that once belonged to a significantly advanced culture. Nico Robin was probably given the rawest deal of all at first, being sent to the bridge nation of Tequila Wolf, a bridge that has been under construction for 700 years at the time of Robin's arrival, where she was captured and made a slave until being rescued by the Revolutionary Army and then accepting their offer to travel to Baltigo, and therefore spent the two year time skip incorporating all of the knowledge that the organization had gathered, led by Luffy's father, Monkey D. Dragon. Frankie found himself on Karakuri Island, which as it turns out was the birthplace of the legendary world government scientist, Dr. Vegapunk, as as well as home to one of his former laboratories. Well, two of his former labs, which was very good news for Frankie after he accidentally self-destructed one of them. Luckily, that was the least important one. And finally, Brooke, in probably the weirdest situation of all, landed on Namakura Island in the middle of a cultist ritual, after which he was worshiped as Satan for quite some time before being abducted by select members of a long arm tribe and becoming a traveling sideshow attraction, all the while working on his musical prowess that would eventually see him turn into a global superstar. As for the rest of the world though, the other notable factor is that the entire of the worst generation, minus Luffy, Zoro, and Law, the latter of who was currently on Amazon Lily after having treated Luffy's injuries, all embarked into the new world, with many facing immediate challenges of the world's most unpredictable sea. And that just leaves us with Luffy, who was taken to the island of Rusukaina by Rayleigh to begin his hockey training. And after demonstrating the basics of all three forms of hockey, Luffy realized that he had encountered these powers over the course of his journey and was astonished at Rayleigh's capacity in regards to wielding them. However, before finally beginning his training, there was one thing left to do as Luffy removed his straw hat, ceremoniously indicating that he was putting his pirate journey on hold, only to be recommenced in two years time. Next time on Sagas in Minutes, we are finally taking flight in the New World Era as the Straw Hats gloriously reunite to take on a chunk of story known as the Fishman Island Saga. 
If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but applied to other anime and manga series, then please do feel free to check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenanigans retakes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the post-war events of the Paramount War Saga. This has been the Ground Line Review, and I'll see you next time. Is there any point in the One Piece story that got you thinking to drop the series? So I've been reading One Piece ever since fairly early-ish in the Any Slobby arc, and I have to say that by and large, this series has kept me 100% captivated from that time right up until where we are today. I've definitely never considered dropping the series, which I think is actually insane, because I've dropped most long-running series after a while. But I will admit that there have definitely been moments where I have considered taking a break from One Piece and letting chapters pile up to read in bulk. One of those points was during Thriller Bark, which I think was a really difficult arc to read weekly because we were coming off this high of any slobby and all of the really great stuff in Thriller Bark was heavily weighted at the tail end of it. So it was a tricky year or so to get through reading weekly for me, but I still kept up with it anyway. The only other point I've seriously considered taking a break was during Dress Rosa. In fact, there was one chapter in particular that almost broke me and it was the one that featured Rebecca, Bartolomeo and Robin flying on the Tontata whatevers. And by this stage, Dress Rosa had just gone on for so damn long with no end in sight. And you know what? I don't even remember what else happened during this chapter, but it just felt incredible incredibly weak, like the weakest One Piece chapter I've ever read in my entire fan lifetime. And I just felt so dejected, like screw Dress Rosa, I should just wait until this is over and catch up. But once again, that was a fleeting feeling and I was straight back to reading it the next week. Luckily, the chapters were all pretty solid after that though, but it was a, uh, oh, it was a true slog to finish that up. Two years of my life spent reading Dress Rosa weekly, two whole years. And to put that into some perspective, in that time, I both started dating and asked my now wife to marry me, all during the events of Dress Rosa.